Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I was actually expecting uh, to talk about algorithmic welfare, but you now since you've been told I'm going to talk about algorithmic warfare, uh, you kind of uh, already know half of my thesis. Um, so I think I'll give it away uh, anyhow, if only to reward those of you who came on time and punish those of uh, you who are not here yet. Um, and uh, the thesis of my talk today will be uh, as follows. Um, I think it will not be a big surprise to any one of you that uh, capitalism is in deep uh, crisis and that the only way in which it can get out of it if only rhetorically so far, is by playing up the theme of perpetual disruption, innovation, and all the other things for which Silicon Valley is famous for. So uh, the key argument I would like to lay out uh, in my talk tonight is that ultimately uh, Silicon Valley at this point represents uh, the last hope for um, creating any kind of uh, legitimation around what capitalism does in terms of not just helping us get by with resources that we still have, but in terms of projecting a future that still is somehow bright and positive and optimistic. I would argue that no other actor, certainly not Wall Street, certainly not uh, most of the uh, corporations engaged in production of physical and material goods, are capable of generating that narrative. So, um, the conclusion I would draw, again, to give it away at the very beginning, is that I don't think Silicon Valley is capable of doing that. And I think that, uh, if anything, its interventions uh, are likely to actually make things worse. Um, but before I proceed to uh, unpack uh, the scissors, let me just start with the uh, data points and anecdotes, uh, which I think might help to situate us in uh, what is about to follow. Uh, so, uh, data point number one is the news from last week that uh, some of you might have heard uh, from Great Britain, namely that uh, NHS, uh, the country's uh, health service, has been sharing details of uh, personal data, personal health data of more than 2 million patients uh, with uh, Google's artificial intelligence uh, division uh, DeepMind. Right, all of that was done, uh, apparently, in order to uh, facilitate um, the generation of insights and analysis uh, by DeepMind uh, in order to be able to detect various diseases, uh, especially those pertaining to kidneys, uh, at an early stage. Okay? Uh, which, of course, triggered an outrage in Britain because not everybody was aware that their data was actually shared with Google, regardless of how anonymized uh, that transaction was. Um, Data point and anecdote number two, which I think did not receive as much attention as it should have, is the news that a couple of weeks ago, Facebook had struck uh, more deals uh, with uh, larger satellite providers uh, in Africa in order to be able to continue and expand its internet or project of providing free connectivity, or free as they put it, uh, into more and more African countries by essentially using satellite internet um, as a way to get people online in a rather limited manner by facilitating access to a handful of websites and, of course, Facebook uh, in order to, as they claim, uh, promote connectivity online, get everybody together and promote a vision of uh, a whole um, connected, uh, globalized uh, universe. Uh, that comes uh, despite uh, a rather public campaign in India uh, which succeeded uh, to defeat a similar effort there, uh, which was rebranded as Free Basics, uh, in order to more or less do the same. That triggered a huge wave of activism uh, from uh, various Indian uh, campaigners and NGOs, and ultimately uh, one of the competition authorities in India shut it down. Uh, but I would like to highlight how this promise of free uh, or free on Facebook's terms, uh, connectivity nonetheless continues and rapidly expands across the globe, uh, tainted as it is, uh, to the agenda of digital colonialism and imperialism, which has tacitly been acknowledged even by some of Facebook's own uh, board members. Um, an anecdote data point number three that I would like to highlight uh, is also something that did not receive a lot of media attention, and it's a feature that Uber has been testing since last year, which received attention only from uh, public transportation um, 
and technology blocks, and it's a feature called um, uh, uh, sort of uh, unified uh, or um, unified pickup spots. Basically, it's uh, unique pickup spots actually, and it basically refers to the ability of Uber not just to pick you up from uh, a place where you are and you indicate through a phone where you are, but actually to tell you where uh, a pickup would be most convenient to Uber. Right? And the rationale there is that if you are willing to walk a couple of uh, blocks or a couple of extra hundred uh, meters uh, to make it more convenient for Uber to pick you up and thus to make it more economically uh, rational, uh, they would actually reward you by, uh, paying, by giving you a discount or charging you a little bit less. Right? And that also comes on the heels of a similar initiative that they've been running already in a couple of cities, including Saddle, which is basically offering uh, bus-like services to shuttle people around. Right? So, and what you see uh, that Google has discovered with this uh, pickup feature is that basically uh, people who have been running public transportation for a century uh, by using fixed locations as opposed to personalized ones actually knew something about the wise and efficient distribution of resources, that it makes much more sense to have fixed picked up locations as opposed to highly personalized ones. Right? And again, I'll, I'll get back to, to, to the to analysis, but I would just like to keep that uh, point uh, somewhere at the back of your mind. Right? What I would argue unites all these three cases is uh, the rapid entrance of uh, Silicon Valley, mostly American technology firms, into areas of uh, social cooperation and social activity and the economy, which go far beyond what used to be their traditional remit, so to say, which was uh, e-commerce, buying things online, and uh, publishing and advertising, right? And advertising funded publishing, right? That has been the bailiwick of Google and uh, Facebook's activity, and you can add Amazon and Netflix with some modifications to it as well. What we have seen in the last five or seven years is the rapid expansion beyond just this bubble of the web or cyberspace or whatever uh, term you would like to throw uh, at it, beyond the uh, contours of this digital space into a world where these companies are increasingly interested in running and optimizing areas of life that have to do with things like transportation, health, education, connectivity, uh, and uh, who knows what other domains would follow. As we have seen, Google is rapidly increasing its presence in areas like anti-aging initiatives, um, blood analysis, uh, and so forth. So you see a huge uh, distribution of its own interest and of its own activities in a number of domains which, thanks to digitization, uh, have, of course, all acquired some kind of informational dimension and thus can be nicely merged and brought together under the um, unique uh, profile that every Google user basically has. I would argue that uh, what has been discovered by a lot of those companies is that by basically uh, moving into adjacent areas and adjacent domains, they can actually take on uh, the provision of many uh, functions and of many services that have been previously uh, taken on and executed by other actors. Um, and uh, under the transition uh, to a fully neoliberal capitalism, with ensuing privatization and offloading of public services into uh, private hands, uh, Silicon Valley can actually, or so it hopes, provide a final uh, legitimizing argument as to why privatization is a good thing. Because ultimately, uh, the, uh, whatever um, horrible service you might have been getting from uh, private transportation providers or private um, health providers or private education providers or private even telecommunication providers, if you think about uh, traditional telecom monopolists like uh, you know, AT&T or Verizon or even here Deutsche Telekom, uh, the moment uh, this new generation of highly digital uh, companies enters that domain, uh, service would dramatically improve and moreover prices would actually fall, if not become free outright, which is the case with most of Google services.
right? So the uh, pitch and the uh, proposition that is put in front of us is that basically a lot of the services that we had to traditionally pay for through taxes or paying fees of some kind could actually be heavily subsidized by advertising. Uh, and this exchange of data tied to advertising would actually allow us to compensate for some of the other effects of austerity and neoliberalism and privatization, which are actually depriving people of growth in real incomes or are increasingly eating up a lot of their disposable income or are basically uh, living them uh, with rents that are far too high. Right, so the, uh, I think if you look at the populism of this argument, to some extent, uh, it's very clever because ultimately, uh, you know, there are two kinds here. So I don't want to say that everything is about becoming free thanks to advertising because it isn't. There is, of course, another way in which prices have fallen dramatically and Uber illustrates it uh, quite well, and it's the fact that these companies can achieve the kind of scale uh, in their particular domain that has been achieved by the likes of Walmart um, in a generation earlier, right? By basically uh, operating on a global giant scale, uh, by treating everything as essentially scalable, and by uh, coming and uh, blowing a lot of investors' money onto entering as many markets as possible, uh, undercharging in those markets where they do face some competition uh, temporarily, and basically through this cross subsidization, uh, making sure that they knock out as much of their competition as possible. Right? And uh, this partly explains why uh, Uber's uh, rents, rates uh, have been uh, so low. In part, it has to do with the fact that they're exploiting tremendous economies of scale, which exist thanks to their global size and the fact that they have a 60 billion valuation tied in part to the money that they have raised from Goldman Sachs, Google, and a bunch of other investors, at this point probably counting every single uh, oligarch uh, from uh, Russia or China, uh, and the fact that uh, you know temporarily they can actually take as much as they want in losses because they're not a private company and they don't have to be accountable to financial markets. Um, that, of course, might change the moment Uber becomes a public company or they realize that they cannot be subsidizing and losing money forever, as they have been, for example, in China, where Uber has been lo losing something like a billion dollars every year, according to their own uh, acknowledgments. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that we're basically seeing a new kind of in commercial intermediaries emerge, which present a very convenient partner to a neoliberal state that is itself interested in becoming leaner, uh, mobile, technology friendly, and in sharing as much responsibility for uh, running uh, any of the uh, activities and domains that were traditionally considered essential uh, to be kept out of the market realm. Right? Uh, and I do not want to be glorifying the welfare state by any means. It has its own problems, and it, uh, those problems have been pointed out quite well by a lot of people also on the left. But I think uh, analyzing this transformation through the perspective of the welfare state is actually not a bad idea, in part because it shows us that uh, the reason why uh, the resistance to the current wave of neoliberal austerity is not as uh, strong as it could have been is precisely because we are dealing with this new set of actors which on the one hand uh, constantly uh, remind us or seek to remind us that the reason why capitalism is not working properly is because we are just not seeing a society that's capitalist enough. In that sense, you know, the rhetoric that Uber and Airbnb and others launch against the incumbent industries, which they take to be corrupt and in bad with regulators, is a very good indicator of that kind of rhetorical strategy, where they tap into this uh, immense reservoir of postmodern suspicion of any institutions in essentially claiming that um, they do not trust any public effort to rein in uh, the taxi industry or the hotel industry or any other industry because ultimately years of bureaucratic regulation have completely uh, stripped those institutions of any kind of faithfulness and uh, honesty and responsibility to consumers. Right? So the uh, argument that follows on that logic is that, well, we need to move to proper capitalism and not some kind of social democratic capitalism tied to some kind of regulatory state.
which still seeks to mingle with how market operates. And I would argue that we shouldn't underestimate uh, the argument that these firms make, uh, because I do think that it resonates with a lot of people's experiences as they actually do take taxis to stay in hotels. Uh, there is a much broader argument to be made here as to whether uh, social democracy uh, fostered the right kind of subjectivity in its subjects uh, to go along with some of the expectations that it placed on them. Uh, and uh, I think that might be a worthwhile subject of debate, uh, in part because you can easily make the case that uh, social democracy and the welfare state to which it was tied uh, from the very beginning was somewhat schizophrenic in character in that um, it said that the market was okay, but only in small doses uh, and in a very regulated manner. And once uh, information technology made it easier to um, evade uh, whatever limits have been previously imposed uh, on opting out by uh, just limits of technology, uh, now we're seeing that the entire foundations can crumble very easily, right? And again, to make it very specific, you can think of something like, you know, a bookstore, which in many cases uh, has been an institution that required a certain type of behavior of its subjects, in part because, you know, you come to a bookshop and you uh, search for a book and you find a book that you find interesting, and, uh, you know, the typical social democratic kind of uh, theory would expect you to be a responsible subject and pay for the book. Uh, and now that you can easily opt out and actually uh, take advantage of the fact that the uh, transaction cost of finding the cost of that book are much lower than the way in the past, we would actually have to leave the bookstore and go to another bookstore and compare the costs. You can easily opt out. Right? So you can kind of think through the same paradigm and think about many other behaviors that we expected to engage in, including, by the way, uh, using a lot of shared services like uh, public transportation, but also private transportation. So if you think about taxes, I think uh, Uber has come at a very interesting time where uh, solidarity ties were already uh, quite eroded thanks to decades of neoliberal policies. So uh, when you do have an environment like this, it's quite obvious that when you give people an opportunity to basically opt out of paying any other fees that might be there to subsidize the other passengers. So in the case of you know, blind passengers, for example, or disabled passengers, right, the way in which the fee has been calculated in many cities is that it also included the costs of small things like trainings for taxi drivers who need to know how to handle blind passengers or how to handle disabled passengers, right? And of course, all of us took on those fees uh, very often without any conscious knowledge that this is how those things were priced, right? Now what has happened is that you have this new type of entrance and new type of intermediaries come in like Uber which basically tell you that, well, we are a technology company, we are an information platform, we are not a taxi company, we are not obliged to offer any trainings to blind or disabled passengers, so we'll actually take those 20 cents off your fee, and those of us who are not blind or disabled are more than happy to pay less, which explains why you do actually see so many savings at the end of the day while using those platforms. Uber, of course, has been managing this uh, problem with a clever PR strategy, passing on a lot of those costs to drivers. So now it's the drivers who have to cover a lot of those costs for um, handling passengers and so forth. But the big point I think that we have to remember is that there has been something of um, an entrance by these firms into domains and services which have traditionally relied on a very different kind of regulation, but also in a very different kind of subjectivity from the citizens, uh, which uh, I'm not actually sure was fully developed in that it was very hard to develop it under conditions of social democracy, which more or less required uh, some kind of constraints to be in place. It could never actually talk about forms, whether it's the common or something else, that existed beyond the market. Um, that said, I think we also have to understand that there is another transformation going on. And that transformation has to do with the fact that uh, if the advertising markets, which have traditionally subsidized many of those platforms and many of those services, right? So you look at uh, information services that you use, and I think this kind of capture of 
our social relationships and uh, of various services that we use has started there at the level of information and telecommunication where traditional models of finding and sharing information which under the conditions of you know the welfare state even earlier before the welfare state have been what they have been libraries which relied on a very different funding model but the idea was that you pay taxes and then you come to a library copyright regime is somewhat suspended you can get access to whatever you want your data does not need to be aggregated as fully as it does with an advertising focused company and you can more or less engage in this heterotopic space into whatever intellectual behavior that you like to engage in right that model itself uh, transforms itself rather radically with the entrance of google and amazon into and especially google into the game uh, but also other forms of uh, through which we paid for dissemination and finding of information just think about something like the post office right which again partly was a system that relied on a combination of tax funding and also on uh, stamps uh, so you actually had user fees uh, coming in up front and that ensured a system which again historically has for has performed many functions from letting communication services be accessible to people in the most remote corners of the country where they would not be able to access it otherwise to promoting some kind of national cohesion by subsidizing the mailing of letters, uh, newspapers, uh, books, and so forth through the postal system. Right? If you think about the way in which Google has entered uh, this industry, right, the model is very different. Uh, you basically have a private firm that comes in, sucks in a lot of information, uh, manages to find an advertising uh, market for your personal information that it has collected, and this is what pays for the provision of the service. Right? Uh, which, of course, has a lot of uh, consequences. So if you look, for example, at how Google, now that it uh, goes beyond just the offering of mail uh, and search, if you look at the service like Google Fiber, which was one of Google's first uh, forays, if you will, into the world beyond just information. And Google Fiber is a Google initiative which seeks to somehow challenge the dominance of the likes of AT&T and Verizon and offering internet access uh, in some American towns. Uh, so what does Google Fiber do? They do not work like the post office, where the idea of universality was still key, where you really wanted to get everybody on, onto the network, even if the network was just that of the post office. Google Fiber works in a very lean kind of um, analytical data-driven uh, manner. They would like first to run a bunch of really detailed empirical studies as to where the demand is, figure out then, based on that demand, how to build the network and then parts of the city, which often happen to be in the poor areas that uh, do not show enough demand or have no money to pay, are just excluded from the network, which is then offered to users of Google Fiber, which again would be normal for a company that is interested in making money but it becomes somewhat problematic once that is the only way through which a lot of uh, infrastructural services are in fact offered. And I would argue that uh, what we will be seeing um, and already seeing with a lot of these platforms and services is a constant uh, expansion of these platforms beyond the small uh, playing grounds where they started into other areas where data can be collected, analyzed, and then packaged with other data, and as such, some kind of service can be provided. That service can be something uh, rather banal as preventive services targeting uh, <coughs> healthcare, right? And we, again, with thanks to Fitbit and all the sensors in our uh, smart devices, we already know how it works, but the idea is that more or less you align this offer with the overall neoliberal transformation of the healthcare system where the hope is to shift as much responsibility onto the shoulders of the patient and the citizen, uh, have them take responsibility for their health into their own hands, and more or less um, deploy whatever sensors are at their disposal uh, to detect the symptoms as early as possible so as to obviate the need to go and see a doctor at all. Right? And if you go and look at the uh, shrinking budgets of national health institutions all across Europe and America, and if you look at rising obesity rates, you will quickly understand that that is in fact the only strategy out there that authorities currently have for tackling the health crisis, right? the health issue or health, the future of health, however you want to put it. 
right? And I think that that in itself is illustrative of how neoliberalism has come to tackle the problems that follow from that regulation. And let me unpack this. So if you go and uh, sort of look at everything that has happened in the last 30 or 40 years, I mean, it's true that there has been a lot of deregulation of the industry, right? That has happened with a strong involvement of the state, so I don't want to make the state somehow the victim here. I mean, the, the neoliberal state itself has been a key actor in enabling a lot of these transformations. But I think we have to understand that this deregulation of the industry, whether it was the car industry, the energy industry, the food industry, or any other industry you can pick, has produced quite a lot of damage. That you know, the regulation has not produced the kinds of results you would see in a traditional neoliberal uh, textbook, whereby these fantastic markets for trading emissions will result in climate change, or you know, the regulating the food industry will result in this fantastic healthy meal sold by McDonald's. All of us will be very slim uh, and uh, happy and resemble uh, inhabitants of some you know Palo Alto in California doing yoga and whatnot. Uh, that did not happen. Right? And if you look at any indicators of where the world is right now, the situation in many dimensions is much worse than it was back in the early 70s before the deregulation started. Whether you know, you're looking at youth unemployment, whether you're looking at uh, uh, you know, pollution levels, whether you're looking at obesity levels, whether you're looking at uh, many other indicators, you'll actually see the situation is much, much worse. And I think a lot of people in uh, elites, among elites, understand that quite well. But they have no way of doing anything about it that is not limited to the level of the individual. Uh, for various reasons that have to do with the complex institutional, legal, technological, and other networks and apparatuses that they have set up, there is no going back to some kind of regulated social democratic model, and I'm not sure that that should actually be the solution to whatever problems they face, but that option is cut off. Right? The only option that they have to compensate for the deregulation of the industry is over-regulation of the individual, right? So uh, when you see that things are about to fall off, that you know people are eating all sorts of junk and not becoming obese, and they are over-consuming too much electricity, and clearly you cannot do anything about the companies who are probably the root causes of all those issues, what do you do? Well, you target the user, you target the citizen, you target the patient. Uh, and this explains, I think, how and why uh, this new informational infrastructural apparatus, if you will, that Silicon Valley has put in front of us can be very profitably tapped by policymakers for nudging our behavior towards whatever objective they think will preserve the system and not ruin it completely. Which means that ultimately the alliance between the state and Silicon Valley here is quite clear and you will become clearer if you go and read any of the texts and policy memos on the embrace of nudging, of nudging or behavioral economics in uh, most European countries or even the United States. Uh, I'm not even talking about uh, United Arab Emirates or Singapore. But the idea is that by tapping into data that is collected in real time from a multiplicity of sensors and analyzing it in real time and using screens and all sorts of other notification um, interfaces, you can actually change and adjust the behavior of the individuals so that the system does not collapse entirely. I think that's the only game in town at this point uh, when it comes to articulating some kind of a positive program as to how whatever remains of neoliberal capitalism can be salvaged. Right? I'm not talking here about finance, we can go into that uh, route as well, but I think the rise of the psychological state combined with the proliferation of uh, network devices and sensors has brought us to a very interesting point where basically these companies, uh, technology companies, they're not just there articulating all these uh, critiques of the state as corrupt and corrupted by uh, uh, incumbents. It's not just uh, you know, a matter of um, providing some kind of a populism, uh, which I think is quite strong in Silicon Valley, which at this point is the primary source of populism other than Donald Trump in the United States. I mean, if you go and listen to the talks of this new class of organic intellectuals, which now are by and large venture capitalists, They'll tell you that the way to solve uh, social mobility in the United States is to make sure that more and more assets can enter circulation on the global market 
And how do you do that? You do that by plugging everybody in, into the sharing economy and making sure that not just our houses or spare bedrooms, but also virtually everything else, doormats, uh, sofas, uh, bicycles, gardens, everything else can enter into global circulation as well. Right? And that more or less is the way in which you improve social mobility. You improve the liquidity with which your assets can enter global financial markets or any other kind of markets that will be mediated by the power of finance uh, one way or another. And I would argue that uh, this constellation of forces and factors uh, is not sustainable for the sole reason that I don't think that advertising can actually uh, continue being the cash cow that will continue paying for the provision of many of those services. In part, I don't think that the rest of the economy is actually in a robust position to withstand the pressure exerted on those parts by Silicon Valley itself. As companies like Google and Facebook expand and become the platforms on which everything is published, they drain a lot of money from the rest of the economy. I don't think you can actually have uh, Google and Facebook as the key gateways and the key platforms that milk every single industry for cash and the rest of the economy being healthy, productive, and generating the kind of money that will actually bring in the advertising to those firms. I don't think that that's actually a sustainable proposition, especially if the expectation is that those firms will take on more and more slices of running our services like we've seen with NHS and um, DeepMind, or like we have seen with Facebook and its uh, entrances in uh, Asia or Latin America or Africa. But I would argue that the other option, which I would like to flag, and I have maybe seven, seven or six minutes before I finish, the other option, which right now is on the table, presented by often the same very people in venture capitalist firms, uh, is probably even less appealing. And it's trying to get rid from this central, of these centralized platforms and moving to new types of intermediaries, be they uh, blockchain mediated or be they mediated by some kind of other new digital highly decentralized intermediary where you can actually have a fully programmable algorithmic uh, um, enforcement mechanism whereby virtually every single social activity or any single object can now be turned into a dynamically priced activity, right? So in a sense, if you go and study some of the buzz around the Internet of Things, smart contracts and blockchains, the future that emerges from this crowd that is apparently attacking centralized forces like Facebook and Google and so forth, the vision of the future that they would like to offer is probably even scarier, in part because what these people would like to do is to make sure that the sensor that will be in every single object that we'll have uh, will actually measure the exact um, strengths and the exact, uh, uh, how should I say, the exact uh, wear and exhaustion of that particular object, and we will be priced for it accordingly. Right? So if you go and read some of the most uh, out of the kind of this world uh, speculations and some of the out of this world uh, manifestos written by this crowd, the idea is that now finally we can actually price. Uh, every one of you, uh, based on how much time you've spent in all of those chairs, how much of you've enjoyed it, and uh, how much it has contributed to actually bearing out and depreciating that chair. Right? The idea that you can actually now combine sensors with uh, algorithmically enforced contracts and tie them to your own digital identities, which are carried somewhere in your digital devices, uh, does create a world in which virtually everything can be financialized, and while you might be getting rid of Google and Facebook, you will actually be ushering in a new world of some kind of uh, feudalism, whereby you'll actually have to pay for virtually everything that you use and every single uh, touch of a button to whoever happens to run the informational infrastructure that happens to power that object, device, platform, and what have you. Right? And ultimately, that also is pitched as a greatest uh, force in improving mobility. Because ultimately, the argument that is made by a lot of these people pushing this uh, blockchain-inspired financialization is that ultimately pricing use of objects and commodities correctly will make many of them far more accessible to ordinary people because you can finally move from the idea of ownership to the idea of access. 
So in a sense, you can actually, because most of us don't use the objects that we have, right? So there is also an implicit, it's not that, it's not as if we're talking about complete privatization of everything, right? That was the neoliberalism 1.0, where the initial uh, kind of fear with which uh, all of us were scared 20 or 30 years ago is that 30 years down the line, you'll have to pay for everything, education, health, uh, transportation, communication services, and so forth. Ironically, that did not happen, right? In that a lot of those uh, domains and industries did get privatized, but there is another set of actors who have currently been subsidizing them. Right? which, as I pointed out, have been Google, Facebook, and so forth. I would argue that the next step, if this current wave of advertising-funded welfare is not sustainable, will actually be complete financialization of every single social activity and object that we use, with the uh, outcome being that we will actually have to pay up for virtually anything that uh, involves any kind of interaction with our own digital identity, right? Which uh, would be a very paradoxical outcome of uh, welfare, but it would be pitched as such nonetheless. And I don't think that, you know, what I'm saying here, and I'm about to wrap up, I don't think that we're actually talking about uh, some kind of wild dystopian uh, project. If you actually go and study the amount of money that's being poured into all of this by not just venture capitalists, but also by the big banks who have in more than in less than two or three years become one of the biggest funders of uh, blockchains, uh, but also by firms like Google or IBM themselves who by any means do not fear this new world because they also can easily switch to a new model where, having crushed down any competition, they can easily start charging for their services. There is nothing absolutely that ties them to advertising as the dominant way of paying for all those services. Right? And um, I think I would uh, probably leave it here, uh, but flag only one remaining issue that I think will be the key to whatever struggles will emerge uh, around this field in the years to come. And that key issue is the city. Because ultimately, the privatization of all those infrastructures is most visible at the level of the city. Uh, the city is also where neoliberalism kind of hits you in the face, regardless of whatever narratives it tells you, because ultimately you do have to pay more for whatever services you're using, including transportation and, and many of the others. So many of the uh, bubbles that uh, neoliberals and uh, fairy tales that neoliberals like to tell us uh, we experience them as holes at the level of everyday life in the city. And the city is also the place where any organized contestation of neoliberal policies is taking place, whether it's through efforts to remunicipalize uh, energy grids or water systems or um, oppose uh, neoliberal housing policies. Right? The problem is that the imposition of the smart city paradigm on top of a city, any city in Europe at this point, will actually greatly limit the space of contestation, but will also disable whatever strategies this popular social leftist movements have relied on in the past. The idea of remunicipalizing Google, which increasingly does enter cities with its own unique called sidewalk labs, is completely beyond reach to any small grassroots-based municipal movement for the sole reason that there is nothing there to remunicipalize in the same way as you could have done with electricity grid or water. These companies don't even enter cities and strike deals with city administrations. They just take you over virtually. Right? And I would argue that anybody who's seriously thinking about ways to come out of the mass in which we're being pushed by this new type of digital uh, hypercapitalism has to be able to understand what are the routes of escape that are now being blocked? And so far, I don't see many other than the city. The problem is that that one is also being closed at a speed that most of us do not realize. So I'll end it here and hopefully we'll discuss a bit more in Q&A. Thank you.